This video is an overview of cyber threats to the maritime transportation system. This video was brought to you by the National Cybersecurity Training and Education Center out of Whatcom Community College. The creation of this video was funded by a National Science Foundation Advanced Technological Education Grant. My name is Philip Kreger. I'm an Associate Professor of Cybersecurity at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach, Florida. So this is the second in a series of videos on maritime transportation cybersecurity. And the second video will first review the maritime transportation system that we talked about in the first video. We will review the fact that the maritime transportation system is actually a system of systems, which will be very important to our discussion. We'll discuss cyber attack vectors on the maritime transportation system. We'll discuss maritime transportation system cyber attack targets. We'll talk about examples of actual cyber attacks on the maritime transportation system. And then we'll talk about what will be contained in the last video of this series. So as we discussed in the last video, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency and the Department of Homeland Security have identified 16 critical infrastructure sectors whose assets, systems, and networks, whether physical or virtual, are considered so vital to the United States that their incapacitation or destruction would have a debilitating effect on security, national economic security, national public health, or safety, or any combination thereof. And the sector we're going to be talking about today is part of the transportation system sector. And particularly, we'll be talking about the maritime transportation system, which consists of about 95,000 miles of coastline, 361 ports, more than 25,000 miles of waterways, and intermodal landside connections that allow the various modes of transportation to move people and goods to, from, and on the water. And normally when we think about maritime, we think about ships. So we think about cruise ships. 38 million passengers use cruise ships every year. We're also talking about cargo containers, which ship billions of tons of cargo throughout the world every year. We're also talking about Navy vessels of all kinds. We're talking about also smaller commercial vessels, such as fishing fleets, as well as recreational boats. But it also includes much more than that. It also includes things like ports. We've also discussed how modernization and computerization greatly changed the way that our transportation systems function. For example, this is the bridge of a fairly old ship, and you notice that nothing on there is computerized. But then contrast that with modern vessels, and you see about 20 different LED screens here, and the entire ship has several hundred miles of networking and dozens to hundreds of computers, and this vessel could not function without this computerization. And in fact, there are companies which are conducting research on having fully automated ships, which means that there would be no human being on the ships. Everything would be run through computerization. And so essentially, especially looking forward, modern ships are essentially floating computers and networks. It would be wrong to think of the maritime transportation system as a single entity. Rather, it's a very complex, interlinked system of systems. Much like the internet is not a single network, but is really millions of networks combining into a single system. And a critical part of these systems of the maritime transportation systems are the information communication technologies that support data storage and transportation of data within and between these systems. And this shows you a high level overview of the ecosystem that is the maritime transportation system. Notice that it consists of multiple important subsystems, including the ships, but not only the ships, but also the shipping lines. It also includes the people that work on the ships and in the shipping lines. It also includes the ports and intermodal transfers, which is essentially a fancy way of saying when cargo and people are transported onto other forms of transportation, including barges, airlines, railroads, and trucking. And finally, whether you know it or not, there's thousands of miles of inland waterways throughout the United States. The maritime transportation system is a highly connected network of systems. When one system is compromised, it can affect other subsystems or the system as a whole. Now, if you've read the news, you probably hardly ever hear of maritime cyber attacks. Maritime cyber attacks are happening more frequently than members of the maritime community believe because of the number of unreported and even worse, undetected attacks. Now, to the general public, we probably already understand that modern planes are highly automated. 
They depend upon information communication technologies to fly, very different from the planes from the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s. Much the same way with cars. Cars back in the 50s and 60s were not modern. They weren't computerized. Now, almost every automobile manufacturer is trying to make cars that can drive by themselves, highly automated with hundreds of different sensors and computing devices. But is the maritime system the same way? How reliant is the maritime transportation system on information communication technologies? Well, let's consider the simple example of a cargo ship like you see here. How much does such a ship rely on information communication technologies? Well, Kessler and Shepard in their book outline all the different systems that you might find on a modern cargo ship starting with the ship network, which includes communications with customs and immigration, email facility and timekeeping. You also have navigation, including GPS, radar and weather. There needs to be some means of updating the computers on the ship, as well as remote access to many of the systems by third parties. There's also the communication systems, which includes the automatic identification system. And we'll discuss this in detail, the AIS, in the final video and actually run through a simulation of how AIS can be spoofed. But it also includes things like the radio, the satellite link, and ship to shore voice over IP. We also have a separate network, hopefully, for the crew, which might include email and entertainment and Wi-Fi and wired, just like you would on a modern airliner. And of course, there's the network backbone for all the different computing devices, which includes the closed circuit TV, our firewall and internet, intercom systems, a master clock, there's also industrial control systems. We'll also discuss those in a little more detail later on. Those are cyber physical systems that control things like cargo handling, human machine interfaces and operational technology, propulsion and steering, which is important to the navigation of the ship. Finally, you have information communication technologies that facilitate loading and stability of the ship. Ships transport cargo and people, but ships also need ports. And ports are where ships dock and cargo and people are loaded and unloaded. Ports themselves are diverse ecosystems consisting of many interrelated entities. Scene in number one, the terminal gate is a secure entry point that is usually manned with a guard and also includes things like closed circuit TVs and alarms that are connected to a computer network. Passengers, employees, cargo and supplies enter through the gate before being loaded onto ships. As seen in number two, the terminal comprises information and communication technology systems at the port. Malign actors will seek to attack by compromising these computer systems in order to access client, employee, ship, or cargo information. Malign actors can disrupt the information communication technologies through the disruption of these systems. For example, by overwhelming them through a denial of service attack, which would knock these systems offline and thereby disrupting all port activity. Because ports have incoming and outgoing vessels destined for other locations, the disruption of one area of a port can cause cascading effects to incoming vessels and to other ports as well. Cyber-physical systems are important parts of ports and ships. Cyber-physical systems are often referred to as industrial control systems. An industrial control system is actually a general term that describes different types of control systems and associated instrumentation, which include the devices, systems, networks, and controls used to operate and or automate industrial processes. In regards to the port, an industrial control system is used to measure and control valves, pumps, cranes, propulsion systems, and cargo handling. A compromised industrial control system can interrupt or shut down port operations or cause physical damage to cargo or equipment. Position, navigation, and timing refers to systems used for port logistics and navigation. These systems can be knocked offline through spoofing or jamming. The concept of spoofing will be discussed later in this video. And finally, we have modern ships. And modern ships are essentially floating computers and networks. Malign actor targets include ships picking up and delivering cargo and or passengers and other vessels as well. An attack on a shipboard computer has the capability of not only affecting other device networks on the ship, but landside communication systems as well. And again, this can have a cascading effect on incoming and outgoing vessels as well as other ports. Let's revisit a concept that you've probably talked about in one of your information security or information technology classes. And that's the concept of information attributes. And three important information attributes to protect include confidentiality, integrity, and availability. 
Confidentiality is protecting information from unauthorized access or disclosure by individuals or systems. An example of an attack on confidentiality was the 2017 data breach of the credit reporting bureau Equifax that resulted in the loss of nearly 150 million credit records containing extensive personal identifying information. Integrity refers to the information being complete, uncorrupted, and authentic. That is, the data that arrives is identical to the data that was sent over the network. The principle of integrity has been extended to the integrity of the information systems themselves, that is, the computers, requiring that systems perform their intended functions free from deliberate or inadvertent unauthorized manipulation. Finally, availability. Availability means to ensure that authorized users can access information when needed. Recent examples of attacks on availability include malware, that is malicious software known as ransomware, which encrypts information stored on a computer, making the information unreadable. The malicious actors subsequently request a monetary ransom, typically via form of cryptocurrency. If the ransom is paid, the attacker releases the decryption key, which is then used to decrypt the information. Now let's look at examples of cyber threat vectors to the maritime transportation system. First, what is a threat vector? Well, a threat vector is a path or a means by which a malign actor gains access to a computer or a network through one or more routes into a computer system or network by exploiting a vulnerability. And there are several different types of routes through a computer and a network, including the network itself, through users, through email, through web applications, or remote access portals. For this presentation, we're just going to focus on a few of those. And we're going to talk about phishing, ransomware, global positioning system spoofing and jamming, automatic identification system, AIS spoofing, and intellectual property theft, and finally, information leakage. Since this isn't a comprehensive video, we're only going to be focusing on some of these for this video. In this video, we're going to talk about phishing and ransomware as the FBI has indicated that the number one threat to cyber systems are ransomware initiated through phishing campaigns. And I'll also describe spoofing and jamming with respect to global positioning systems. And most of us use the global positioning system satellites every day. For example, for navigating to a store or to school. But it's more accurate to say the GPS involves the Global Navigation Satellite Systems, or something called GNSS. And GNSS is a general term describing any satellite constellation that provides positioning, navigation, and timing services on a global or regional basis. And in the next video, we're going to go in-depth into something that's very unique to the maritime transportation system, and that is automatic identification systems, that is AIS, where Dr. Gary Kessler will actually perform a simulation of an AIS spoofing attack on a seagoing vessel. The FBI has indicated that the current greatest cyber threat is ransomware that is delivered through phishing emails. So what is phishing? Well, phishing is the most common social engineering attack. The term social engineering is the psychological manipulation of people into performing actions or divulging confidential information. And phishing is an umbrella term for several types of social engineering attacks. And although it's the social engineering attack can occur through any medium, including text messages, phone calls, regular mail, and even face-to-face, -face, the most common attack vector is through email. Phishing attacks are one of the most common cyber attack vectors across both government and industry. The goal of the malign actor is to use social engineering to dupe unsuspecting victims to react to the contents of the email. And here's an example that probably everybody has seen. This is a, appears to be an email from Amazon offering access to a free $50 gift reward. But let's look at this a little more closely. So the malign actors have created this and it appears to do a pretty good job of mimicking what an Amazon email would look like, including the fonts and the color scheme. But if we look more closely, we'll notice that the malign actor is trying to manipulate us psychologically. For example, notice the term final notice up here. They're trying to engender a sense of urgency, which is psychological manipulation. The malign actors are, are also using people's greed, is that people want free things. Everybody likes something that's free. And so they're trying to manipulate the users into clicking on these links so that the user will provide some sort of information. And I'm guessing, because I didn't click on this, but it's probably credential information for Amazon. That is my Amazon username 
and password. So the malign actors are trying to manipulate us psychologically through using the sense of urgency, the sense of greed. But if you wanted to know whether this is a valid email from Amazon, all you have to do is to hover your mouse pointer over one of these links and it will show you where it's actually going to go to. Is it going to Amazon or someplace else? And you see here, this is where it's going to, sundayspeed.com. I have actually went in and did a little more investigation into this. This had nothing to do with amazon.com. So what is the point of the phishing threat vector? Well, there's actually different payloads or different objectives or goals for the malign actor. The first is to encourage the user to click on a link that takes them to a website. They then ask them to type in their credentials. For example, in the previous example, Amazon, that is their username and password. And so you may think, well, they'll only get my username and password for my Amazon account. From my studies of my students throughout the years, I find that my students may have 50 accounts or 100 accounts online, and they typically use three or four or five combination username and passwords, which means that if they can get your Amazon information, they can probably break into other systems. The bottom line is always have a unique combination username and password for each online account. And the best way to do that is through the use of a password manager. And I have a video that discusses password managers that I would encourage you to view. A second and perhaps even more nefarious goal is that the malign actors want the user to click on a link to an assumed important document that is attached to the email. This could lead to the following. The document is not actually an executable file that when clicked, it executes. That means it runs on the system. This could run ransomware, and we'll discuss what ransomware is shortly. Or it could install a sniffer, that is a small program that's resident in memory that steals usernames and passwords. Or it could open a network connection to the internet or other onboard systems on the ship. So we know that everybody is targeted through phishing emails. So we would assume that shipboard networks is that the captains that are navigating the ship are going to be receiving emails. But if one of the systems on the shipboard network is infected with malware, it is then resident on the ship and it has the ability to affect other systems. Unless these systems are segregated from these other systems, which normally they should be. But as we know, information communication technologies and securing those is very difficult to do. So it's not always done properly. And therefore, there is the possibility to infect other systems on the ship. Now let's discuss ransomware. So what is ransomware? Well, it's malware that encrypts data on a storage device. That is a hard drive. So the encryption is sufficiently strong that the files cannot be decrypted without a decryption key. So once the ransomware encrypts the files, usually a message is presented to the user that explains what has occurred, that is the user's files have been encrypted, and how to purchase a decryption key using some form of anonymous cryptocurrency so that there can be no attribution back to the identity of the malign actors. The actual malware that infects the host computer and encrypts files often arrives in the form of a legitimate appearing attachment to an email, for example, an invoice. Once the attachment is clicked by the user, the ransomware silently starts the encryption process. The user is normally unaware of the encryption running until it is too late. That is, after the hard drive is encrypted. So what does encryption look like? So this is just a screenshot of a document that I had on my computer, and then I encrypted it. So let's see what that looks like. Well, it looks something like this. So no longer is the file readable. Also, if this was an executable file, it would not be able to execute. So there's actually two targets for ransomware. One is the data files that look like this. As we already discussed in the first video with regard to the Maersk incident, is that their entire systems were shut down because the logistics information, the things that you can read on the screen, you know, customers and transit information, could not be read. But also, the computing systems themselves, the operating system files, could no longer work because they were encrypted. And again, this is a prime example of a malware attack on the maritime transportation system. It turns out that the ransomware that attacked Maersk was something called NotPetya. 
and it cost the shipping giant Maersk over $200 million. Initially, that ransomware was executed on a single computer on the Maersk's network. The ransomware spread quickly across the global IT infrastructure, encrypting hard drives across 170 Maersk global offices, forcing the recovery efforts to the entire IT infrastructure, including reinstalling software and files on over 4,000 servers, 45,000 personal computers, and 2,500 applications over a 10-day period. Now, the ransomware attack resulted in the incapacitation of the Maersk's infrastructure as almost all office computers were inoperable, disrupting the company's ability to accept shipping orders, but also stranding millions of tons of freight in transit. Port terminals in the United States, India, Spain, and the Netherlands, all run by Maersk, experienced massive disruptions. Although the cargo container ship's computers were not affected, it didn't matter because the Maersk's office computers, most of which contained the logistics programs and information on their supply chain, were inoperable. Even when the container ships were able to dock at a port, thousands of semi-trailer trucks that pick up and distribute cargo were unable to collect their cargo as there was no way of knowing which containers were on the ships or the cargo that was inside. And again, this because of the intimate connectedness of the maritime transportation system, a single attack on a single system can have a cascading effect on all other parts of the system, and in this instance, all the way to the customer. Now, finally, let's talk about GPS spoofing. GPS is the term that's very specific to the Western world and specifically to the United States, but it more it really refers to the global navigation satellite system, and there's actually quite a few countries that have their own GNSS satellites. So it's a general term describing a satellite constellation that provides position, navigation, and timing services on a global or regional basis. So what is spoofing? Well, spoofing is when you have a malign actor that tricks the GPS receiver, which could be your phone or a GPS receiver on a ship, including the applications running on it, into thinking that you're in a place or another time. So GPS and other GNSS satellites circle the Earth in medium Earth orbit, which is thousands of miles above the Earth. Now, because of the distance from the Earth, these signals are weak, but also the civilian bands, the ones that we use, the ones that ship use, they're also unencrypted and they are not authenticated. So why are those bad? Well, we can't do anything about the weak signals, but the fact that it's satellite feeds with the position, navigation, and timing information are not authenticated means that the applications are receiving them over a certain frequency, but you never know whether that information is actually being authenticated as coming from a GNSS satellite. It could be another system, and that's where spoofing comes into play. So spoofing can occur through a terrestrial radio transmitter that mimics these signals at a greater signal strength than the actual satellite feed, effectively replacing the real GPS signals with a fake signal. This used to be very complicated, requiring expensive electronics that only militaries could do. However, now it is easy to gain access to such a transmitter. In fact, you can buy one on eBay. So this seems kind of far-reaching, right? This probably never occurs on a grand scale. Well, that's wrong. The Russians have started hacking into the GNSS system on a mass scale to confuse thousands of ships and airplanes about where they are located. Of course, your phone, law enforcement, shipping, airlines, and power stations, anything dependent on GPS time and location synchronization are all vulnerable to these types of hacks. So a study showed that in 2019, that there are 1,300 civilian ships that had been affected by this. And of course, it's only going to be in this area right in here in the Black Sea. But also, there were nearly 10,000 incidents that were reported or detected. And just to show you how easy this is, in the summer of 2013, a research team from the University of Texas at Austin successfully hijacked a GPS navigation system on board an $80 million super yacht using a $2,000 device the size of a small briefcase. The experimental attack forced the ship's navigation system to relay false positioning information to the vessel's captain, 
who subsequently made slight course corrections to keep the ship seemingly on track. So now let's discuss maritime transportation systems shipboard cyber targets. And we're not going to discuss all of these, otherwise this would be a four hour video, but let's talk about the ship to shore digital links. And we've already shown how that works in a previous part of this video. Of course, ships are becoming more integrated with shoreside operations because digital communication is being used to conduct business, manage operations, and retain contact with the head offices. Critical safety and navigation systems for power and cargo management have become increasingly connected to the internet to perform a wide variety of functions, including engine performance monitoring, remote ship diagnostics, maintenance and spare parts management, cargo and container tracking and management, loading and unloading, and stowage planning, crane and pump management, monitoring of systems for adherence to environmental regulations, and reporting. And finally, voyage performance monitoring. So we've already demonstrated that ships are connected via the internet to their home offices land site. And therefore, shipboard systems are remotely accessible and may operate with a continuous internet connection for remote monitoring, data collection, maintenance functions, safety, and security. And these systems can be third-party systems, whereby a contractor remotely monitors and maintains these systems. These systems may include a two-way data flow and or upload-only function. Systems and workstations with a remote control, access, or configuration functions could, for example, be bridge and engine room computers and workstations on the ship's administrative network, cargo such as containers with temperature control systems or specialized cargo that are tracked remotely, stability decision support systems, hull stress monitoring systems, navigational systems including the electronic navigation chart, voyage data recorder and dynamic positioning, load planning, stowage and cargo management, engine monitoring and control, and safety and security networks such as closed circuit televisions, all connected over the internet to the land side base. And finally, there are ship visits by third parties. So third party ship visits requiring a connection to one or more computers on board can also result in connecting the ship to the shore via the internet. Commonly, technicians, vendors, port and other officials, maritime terminal representatives, agents, pilots, and other technicians to board the ship and plug in devices such as laptops and tablets. Some technicians may require the use of removable media to update computers, download data, and or to perform other tasks. So let's look at some common cyber vulnerabilities. For those of you in cybersecurity courses or information technology courses, I want you to think as you're watching, as you're listening to these vulnerabilities, how this directly applies to what you normally learn in your classes. So the following are common cyber vulnerabilities which may be found on board existing ships and on some new build ships. And those are obsolete and unsupported operating systems, outdated or missing antivirus software and protection from malware, inadequate security configurations and best practices, including ineffective network management and the use of default administrator accounts and passwords and ineffective network management, which is not based on the principle of least privilege. Shipboard computer networks, which lack boundary protection measures and segmentation of networks. Safety critical equipment or systems always connected with a shore side. And finally, inadequate access controls for third parties, including contractors and service providers. So based on what we've learned in this video, it should be clear that that maritime transportation system is a highly linked system of systems. Maritime transportation system is increasingly reliant on information communication technologies, and that will continue in the future. And finally, attacks on one system may cascade to other systems. So in summary, what have we discussed? We reviewed the maritime transportation system and we reviewed the maritime transportation system as a system of systems that's highly interconnected through information communication technologies. We talked about cyber attack vectors. We talked about examples of cyber threats and actual cyber attacks to the maritime transportation system. And so for the final maritime transportation system series video, we're going to be even more technical. We're going to discuss more cyber attacks that have occurred on the maritime transportation system, both actual and theoretical. And also we have a guest lecturer, Professor Gary Kessler, 
who is an expert in maritime cybersecurity, and he's created his own simulated attack on the automatic identification system, which is a crucial part of maritime transportation, as well as maritime transportation system cybersecurity. This video was brought to you by the National Cybersecurity Training and Education Center out of Whatcom Community College, funded through a grant from the National Science Foundation.